Welcome to the conclusion of the Boo arc and the original Dragon Ball series in Dragon Ball Dissection. Before I get too emotional over this 10 year journey reaching such a milestone, I have a lot of ground to cover. First, I said I needed to look at the ending of the series in terms of it being an ending for the series. Goku and friends return to the tournament only for Goku to run off with a seemingly random boy who is actually the reincarnation of Majin Buu. So what kind of an ending is this anyway? I've not done any studies on this, but from my own anecdotal experience, fans don't seem to hold this ending in high regard. Those who don't like this one tend to prefer Dragon Ball GT's ending, even people who don't particularly care for that series in general. And from what I gather, they prefer that ending for its higher emotions, grander sense of loss, and because it, well, serves as more of a functional end to Dragon Ball. It caps things off. There's no way for the story to continue in the same way from that point on. Basically, it's everything Dragon Ball's ending is not. Dragon Ball's ending shouts at you that things can continue. They will continue. Goku will keep being Goku. Dragon Ball's ending is light. It's open. It's casual. Personally, I've never had a problem with how the ending is structured. Sure, I can enjoy a heavy, definitive ending, but unless it goes out of its way to ruin the overall series, an ending is really not too huge of a deal to me, at least not compared to the experience as a whole. I can't deny this seems like the type of ending that fits a series like Dragon Ball. As much as certain fans want the series to end in overwrought melodrama and sacrifice, a shrug and a have fun message seems much more appropriate. Personally, I like the open-endedness of it, that quick peek at the world, a brief reintroduction to the characters, the casualness of the diegetic events mixed with the emotion of the framing devices. It balances both of those just enough that even though the characters aren't treating anything like it's out of the ordinary, the author recognizes that it's important for us and throws in moments that make it special. And there's just something charming about Toriyama's message at the end of the next to last chapter stating that something is going to happen next time. But don't get your hopes up too much. That's probably my favorite part of the ending, the forewarning that it's really not going to be a big deal. It's equal parts promotion, humility, damage control, and humor. I absolutely love it. However, just because I'm a fan of its concept and presentation, it doesn't necessarily mean I think the actual sequence of events manages to hit the mark. If it fails in any regard, it's with Oob. I kind of already hinted at this last time when I admitted I don't think he earns the right to be Goku's successor. He doesn't really earn the right to anything. Oob doesn't make much of an impression at all. He doesn't have a chance to. Because of that, why should anybody care about Goku being so excited about him? The good thing about Oob is that he does finally bring the story back around to the idea of passing the torch to a new generation, an idea the Boo arc constantly harps on, but spectacularly fails to ever deliver. Unfortunately, making Oob the personification of that idea serves as something of a slap in the face to a lot of the other characters. Now, I would never say that it's wrong if Gohan, Goten, and Trunks would prefer not to devote their lives to martial arts. That's perfectly fine. I want an ending where those characters are happy with themselves. However, the way the story frames it causes them to come off as pathetic failures that Goku decides to abandon. It recontextualizes much of the Boo arc so that Goku training the kids isn't about prepping them to take over for him, but so they can tame Boo to allow Boo to become Goku's ultimate prize. Goten and Trunks are simply a means to an end. That casts a rather sinister shadow over everything. In addition, the placement of the new characters comes across as redundant. Why do both Oob and Pan need to exist? They basically fulfill the same function, or at least as much of a function as they can serve in their limited appearances. Cutting one out could have given the other twice as much screen time and allowed for that much more characterization. Based on the brief introductions they have, if I had to choose one to keep, it would be Pawn. She's far more engaging and is far easier for the audience to form a connection with. Pawn serves as a final reminder of one of my favorite aspects of Dragon Ball. Time. Years pass, characters age, relationships change, and new generations are born. Pan's mere existence speaks more about the progression of the characters than Oob could ever hope to. She's introduced at the age of four, which is the same age as Gohan at his first appearance. After it's retcon, that is. She basically becomes a stand-in for Gohan, which is far more satisfying than random reincarnated boy. 
It ties the storyline together, indicating that Gohan has passed the torch to his daughter to finally allow him to lead the life he wants to. Or at least it would if Goku didn't run off without her. Now, I understand why Pan is a less exciting choice, at least as the story is written. The existence of Oob is a good hook. He lends additional weight to Majin Buu and the ending of that fight. His existence serves as a metaphysical reward to Goku for all he has done. And because he's a random kid, it allows for suspense, a surprise, a twist. There's no shock to Pan, no hidden depths, no twist. Unless maybe you made her the reincarnation of Majin Buu. That might have been interesting. Oob and Pan are basically two halves of the same idea. Oob is the concept, Pan is the character. I'd argue a good character is better than a good concept. I think it's quite telling that Dragon Ball GT dumps Oob the first chance it gets and gives the spotlight to Pan instead. The other contentious issue is the idea of Goku abandoning his family. This is one of those moments that influences a lot of fans' perceptions of Goku, casting him as this selfish jerk who never cares about his family. Yes, I take issue with Goku's decision to stay in the afterlife after the battle with Cell. He can come back. His logic for not doing so is nonsensical. But at least his death and initial absence are reasonable and noble. That's typically the pattern. The storytelling can be strained, but there's some level of understandable sacrifice to his absences. The usual justifications don't apply here. He just up and leaves for no other reason but his own desires. How you feel about this is going to depend on how much logic you let in versus how much emotional storytelling you want to see. After all, Goku is super fast and can teleport. There's really no reason not to think Goku just warps home for dinner every evening. He really can have it all. And as far as this exists as a standalone series, there's nothing to contradict that. However, in terms of the storytelling, this moment loses any weight it has by not treating this as some sort of goodbye. The narrative certainly wants you to think he's leaving. What's even the point of running off at all if it's just for the afternoon? Then again, the ending is so casual and so open-ended that maybe it is supposed to be just that unimportant. Be it, I'm just gonna say no to the Dragon Balls, I'm going to nobly stay dead for a reason that's not even true, or I'm just gonna leave now, bye. There hasn't been a totally believable justification for Goku leaving his family since Raditz, but I find this one slightly more strained than any of the others. So that's quite enough about the ending. Let's look at the arc as a whole. There's no need to be too dramatic about this. All of you already know, the Boo arc receives a score of 1 out of 10. In terms of the original Dragon Ball, I find it to be the weakest storyline. So why is that? While I have many commenters upset about how disrespectful I supposedly am to Dragon Ball, I had just as many people this time thinking I was going too easy on this arc. If it was obviously going to receive my lowest score, why did I have so many good things to say about it? Allow me this tangent for a moment. The Majin Buu arc reminds me quite a lot of the eponymous album by The Beatles. The Beatles. Popularly referred to as The White Album, it was the only double album the group created, with over twice as many songs as their usual LPs. It contained a lot of variety and experimentation with genre. It also represented a rather fractious period for the band and could be described as four solo albums. Each member indulged his own creative directions, they sometimes recorded separately, Ringo temporarily quit. The result was a beautiful mess. The most diverse, but perhaps least polished collection of Beatles songs. There's something for everybody, but not necessarily everything will be loved by everybody. This album contains an eight minute long avant-garde sound loop. Producer George Martin has said that he thought it really should have been cut down to a good single album. I myself have mused what 14 songs I would keep if I was forced to cut it down. At the same time, though, I can't deny its unwieldiness is part of the charm, its core identity. The White Album wouldn't be the White Album if the Beatles didn't just throw in everything to see what would stick. The Majin Buu arc is likewise a beautiful mess. It's sloppy and eclectic, and that makes it a lot of fun. And I can already tell you're further confused. Why then does it get my lowest score? Well, an album is a bit different than a serialized story. At the end of the day, the White Album's a collection of 30 separate songs. If you don't like the whole package, that doesn't really affect the merits of the individual pieces. I love individual pieces of the Boo arc. 
I list Great Saiyaman and Mr. Satan's taming of Boo among my favorite Dragon Ball moments. The conclusion of the fight is well handled, Videl and Trunks are fantastic new characters, Boo is oftentimes a great villain. Even as infuriating as Vegeta is written, I can't help but be impressed by the ambition in closing out his storyline. However, a collection of great moments does not necessarily coalesce into a great story, and the sum of the Boo arc's parts manages to be less than the whole. I'm not scoring individual Dragon Ball chapters, I'm scoring an arc, so its fantastic moments don't really matter as much if the arc itself isn't cohesive. Here's the truth, though. As far as my personal enjoyment goes, the Piccolo Daimo arc is probably my least favorite. There are many more individual elements of the Boo arc I think are more entertaining. But I think the Piccolo arc is still a stronger storyline. Not much stronger, but stronger. This story has no idea what it wants to be, because it's written on the fly. But unlike most other Dragon Ball stories, that fact is often painfully obvious. Nowhere is that more apparent than with Gohan. The Great Saiyaman opening requires such an awkward redirection. Gohan is frequently sidelined, a la the main character, but never gets any kind of significant development or satisfying payoff. His story, his relationships, his struggles are placed on hold and then never really picked back up again. And obviously that applies to the other characters included in his story, like Videl, who at best serves as a courier or a Mr. Satan stand-in once the story proper gets going. So many people have hit me with the, well, she's never going to be as strong as the main characters, so what can she possibly do? Well, first I'd argue then that it's a waste to introduce her as a major player if there's nothing she can possibly do. But it's not as if this arc doesn't get great use out of a character who can't possibly keep up, and who happens to be related to her. Don't get me wrong, I far and away think Mr. Satan is the superior choice with a more dramatic character arc to be the buffoon who saves the world in spite of himself. But that clearly proves there are other options to work with here. If we are talking about women who can perceivably keep up, what about number 18? On one hand, I love her focus at the Tenkaichi Budokai. As far as B stories go, that's a pretty good one. And it's much better focus than other B tier cast members receive. But after that, she stands around in the background like everyone else. Yeah, I get that she's only in the tournament for the money, but she does have a husband and child to protect. She could do something. Adding number 18 to the group ultimately feels like a trophy for Kuririn. A quick payoff to his character beats in the Cell arc that has nowhere else to go in this one. And those are just the most obvious examples. I've not been shy expressing how little most of the cast has to do. Of course, the biggest dropped idea in the arc is, it's time for the next generation to take over. Clearly it's not. Well, you know, unless you're some random mohawk boy, but the pattern seems to indicate he's just going to end up a massive disappointment that Goku has to save. I do have to break in to remind all of you that many of the problems contained in Dragon Ball are a result of Toriyama not planning things in advance, and that I'm typically impressed by his ability to make things work despite putting himself at such a disadvantage. The analytical side of me enjoys seeing the seams, sussing out where he sees a certain plot isn't working, and seeing what his solution to it is. I sympathize with that, but it doesn't excuse it when problems occur. Abandoning the theme because it wasn't working might have been the best idea, but next generation ideas are presented so frequently and as such a core component that there's really no way to defend how disappointingly those ideas are resolved. Or not resolved. If there is a theme in this story that works, it's about humanity, how far it can fall and what it can aspire to. The opening narration talks about how evil increases in peacetime. The story opens in Satan City, named after the world's deceiver. Crime runs rampant, people are stupid and cowardly, and then their representative, the stupidest, most cowardly one of all, nearly manages to save the day by making friends and teaching positive virtues. The day is saved not through the greed and selfishness represented by the bank robbery at the beginning, but by people actively giving of themselves. I think that's a pretty good message, that even the least of us can make a difference as long as we're willing to do so. The funny thing, though, is that the message butts up against what Dragon Ball typically is about, which is one guy getting really strong and saving the day. And trust me, as someone who frequently complains about the Dragon Ball formula, 
I am more than happy to see the Boo arc try to mix things up. That's why I've so often praised these specific elements. But I think it highlights the biggest problem with the Majin Buu arc. It might be a great story, if only Dragon Ball didn't get in its way. In more recent years, Toriyama said he liked Great Saiyaman and admitted, I figured it was time to come up with a new enemy, even though I would have liked to just go on with the slice of life stuff. He enjoyed Gohan's fun high school adventures, but Dragon Ball was supposed to be about something else. Mr. Satan can't directly save the day because we haven't had the big fight. There can't be too much irreverent comedy because the stakes need to be earth-shatteringly high. Juxtaposition can be effective and sometimes is in this storyline. Boo himself is the best example, a villain that would have trouble working in other arcs but fits perfectly here. His menace is heightened because of how playful and silly he is while doing terrible things. However, there are so many clear examples I've given of opposites fighting against each other, diluting each other. Now, I'm not saying that the fans made Dragon Ball worse, that if they just left poor Toriyama alone, this brilliance would shine through. All I'm saying is, for whatever reason, Toriyama appears to have been at cross purposes at this arc, and rather than resolving that issue, he compromised. And the results are... mixed. I think it gives the arc a unique identity, which I prefer all DB arcs possess. I've said I love Gotenks, I think he's very funny, very entertaining. But I also recognize he deflates almost all tension in the fight to save the world because he can't take anything seriously. He legitimately can't. It would be out of character for him to act any other way. The individual elements make sense in a vacuum, but when put together, they don't necessarily fit. The expectations of Dragon Ball also harm this story through its escalation. I won't say a story is ruined just because of logical hiccups or the occasional plot hole, but there are so many of them here. This time last year, some people were getting understandably frustrated that I was spending so much time talking about Piccolo's fusion paradox or Gohan's death whatever. I get that. However, that's what the story was doing. It wasn't the occasional issue. Working around years of Dragon Ball's own rules and precedents is the fuel this story runs on. It seems Toriyama couldn't introduce any piece of drama without running headfirst into a problem he'd created in the past. Or at the same time. If it's not the Dragon Radar, it's dead people who act like living people. If it's not rules for wishes, it's how long it takes to learn a dance, or how permanent this permanent upgrade actually is. The Cell arc rather infamously forces its plot along by creating one big moment where all the characters have to act stupid. The Boo arc, by contrast, has tons and tons and tons of little moments where things either don't make sense or have to be awkwardly explained around. And that's my main point. The Majin Boo arc demonstrates that Dragon Ball really didn't have anywhere else to go after this point. It escalated things as far as they reasonably could be taken. We killed everybody. We didn't just blow up a world, we blew up the world. The story is bursting at the seams with rationalizations against all of its rules. The Majin Buu arc is the last gasp of a series that desperately needed to end. I think Toriyama pushing against the expectations of Dragon Ball is a sign of his creativity. I also think it's a sign that he was tired of it. That there were other directions he'd rather be expressing that creativity. I'm also guessing the art is a similar sign. I am not a visual artist, and I have the utmost respect for people who can create evocative images. Toriyama is a great artist. The Majin Buu arc, however, is not representative of his best work. There are many fantastic examples in this arc of Toriyama giving his all, but when it's not something that needs to be important, a lot of panels look like rough sketches. Compare his large crowd shot in the first story arc to similar groupings in this arc. The difference is night and day. No criticism I could level against it, however, would be as effective as me sharing with you that I received a comment while covering this arc asking if my scans were making the art look bad. It looks so off in places that I can understand that it was easier to believe that I did something to it. Another sign is in the page count. For most of its run, a chapter of Dragon Ball consisted of 15 pages. There were 14 pages of story and one title page. By the Boo arc, however, that changed. 
Dragon Ball chapters became 13 pages total. There were rarely title pages. Instead, a third of the first page consisted of the Dragon Ball logo, eating into more of the actual narrative. Again, I must reiterate that I get it. Between Dr. Slump and Dragon Ball, he'd been drawing weekly chapters nearly continuously for a decade and a half. As someone who only has to critique other people's stories every other week, and is still stressed out all the time? I can scarcely imagine how he did it. Toriyama was almost certainly suffering from burnout by this point. To me, that shows in the work, and he clearly knew it was time to draw things to a close when he did. I'd wager, though, the beautiful mess that is the Majin Buu arc is precisely why those who love it love it so much. It's oozing with creativity, irreverent charm, a freedom to experiment and play. I would take that any day over so many of the safe, cookie-cutter Dragon Ball stories we've gotten in the 21st century. Just because I think it's overall the weakest story of the original series doesn't mean I don't appreciate it for how purely Toriyama it is. It can be brilliant. And it can be a disaster. It rarely fails to make an impression. Now it's time for a trip down memory lane. Let's recap my thoughts on the series, briefly. The Red Ribbon Army Arc it's a wonderful set of adventures that expands Dragon Ball's world into a far more interesting and diverse place than it ever has been or ever will be. Its only major problems are underutilizing its main cast and replacing them with characters not nearly as interesting. The Saiyan Arc. Fantastic exploration into Goku's origins, bringing into the story two of its most popular and enduring characters. Storytelling and character development are expertly carried out through fighting. Middle act feels lacking. The story telegraphs most of its character deaths by not giving them any prior focus. The 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai arc hammers in the passage of time and growth with these characters, highlighting their maturity and connections. Villains work as dark mirrors of the Muten Roshi, Yamcha, and Kuririn, although Chaozu in particular never evolves beyond evil Kuririn. The Hunt for the Dragon Balls arc it's a fantastic introduction to the wacky world of Dragon Ball. While it's not always tonally consistent with what comes later, it shines with a cohesive story and sharply defined characters. Except for Pu'ar. The 21st Tenkaichi Budokai arc. It's a great jumping off point for tournaments, expanding an established character and presenting an iconic addition. It's less story focused than its predecessor, but a great introduction to the idea that Dragon Ball is always changing and there's no status quo. The Frieza arc. Its first half is fantastic. Danger around every corner requires stealth. Vegeta transitions effortlessly from main villain into rogue agent. Freeze is a dangerously charming villain. Its second half is a slog of pointless transformations codifying some of Dragon Ball's worst tropes. The 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai arc. It's an exciting cap to DB's interest in tournament arcs. Reintroducing Son Goku as a man is one of the biggest shifts. Its premise, however, stretches the credulity of the tournament format, and all the plot threads and established characters leave little room for new blood. The Cell Arc. The characters are blithering idiots when the plot requires it. Cell evolves into the blandest of DB's main villains. Fortunately, the vagaries of time travel hide some of the bigger flaws and allow for twists to keep the story engaging. The Piccolo Daimo Arc. Credit is due for delivering DB's first serious arc, but it fails to stick the landing. The mysticism of God and tear-jerking character sacrifices don't quite make up for its less satisfying remixes of Red Ribbon plot elements, nor its fairly stock villains and structure. And finally, the Majin Buu arc. There's so much charm and humor on display. When it works, it really works. But more often than not, it gets lost under the weight of its own legacy and lack of direction. Wow, I could have saved myself 10 years if I'd just done that to begin with. The power of hindsight. Well, here we are. Gives me chills just to say that sentence. I so frequently think of what I said when I first started the Frieza arc, that despite having worked on this for over four years, I still wasn't even halfway through the series. That sort of dual mindset has been with me for a very long time, being both terrified of the huge void finishing this would leave in my life, coupled with the exasperation that I'd never be done covering it. 
now that I'm here, I continue to feel that reviewing the original Dragon Ball is both too much and not enough. That it's taken forever while feeling like the blink of an eye. There are very few fandoms from my childhood that I'm still actively engaged in. I don't even know if I could begin to tell you why it's Dragon Ball, of all things, that has stuck with me for nearly 24 years now. At the same time, though, I don't know what I could say that explains it better than the currently 136 installments of Dragon Ball Dissection. If you don't know by now, well, I guess you're not alone. <laughs> it seems like there are a lot of people who think I actively hate it. But if you've been here long enough, you're probably of a similar mindset to me, that critically examining something you love is fun and rewarding. I certainly hope I've managed to share my opinions of Dragon Ball in a way that's passionate but never mean-spirited, never rude or hurtful to the creative minds who shape Dragon Ball. I hope it's something all of you have had fun sharing with me. I hope I've given you new things to think about, just like all of you have given me new things to think about. I remember being 13, 14 years old and imagining creating my own Dragon Ball webpage where I could talk about all the things that made me like Dragon Ball. I'd be one of those cool kids with my own cool space. This was years before there even was a YouTube. I never actually made a website, but I think I've done okay, in my own way. But, you know, of those 136 Dragon Ball Dissection installments, 39 of them have nothing to do with the original Dragon Ball manga. DVD has expanded its scope over the past decade. There are still more movies, adaptations, and whole series to cover. I really hope all of you know by now that I have committed to covering Dragon Ball GT. I'm excited about it because I know I have a lot to say. I'm also terrified because I don't have the same encyclopedic knowledge of it as I do the original manga. I can't think to myself, oh, I'm looking for that moment where Goku says this. Right, I know exactly where to find that. As of right now, I've only seen the series all the way through once. So that's fun. I hope you'll be excited for it. I hope you'll be patient with me. And if I have any questions, I hope you'll be able to help me. But even before that, we're coming back next time to cover the final 90s Dragon Ball Z movie, and then the animated Boo arc. Clearly, there's a lot more to dissect, so I'll be sharpening my scalpel. But as for that original 42-volume series, it's time to close the book on it. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Woo! All right, DBD 1029, final section, take one. Action. Let's see what the framing is. Blah, 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 Dragon Ball, blah, blah, blah. That it's taken forever while feeling like the blink of an eye. There are many fandom. Damn it. Test shot two, blah blah blah, I don't care, series is over, meh! Ah, help me, somebody help me. Part 29? What kind of stupid number is that to end on? I couldn't have gotten to 30?